You're watching CNBC On Demand. In this episode of American Greed, it's a crime for our times. It's largely a cautionary tale about the culture of Silicon Valley. The rise and fall of Elizabeth Holmes and her billion dollar blood testing startup, Theranos. She was the next big thing. What everyone had been waiting for, the next Steve Jobs or the next Bill Gates, but of healthcare. I must say, you are an extraordinary woman. Is she a genius founder with a noble mission? In my mind, I've always thought the true legacy of Silicon Valley is to build great products that can make a difference in the world. Or a brazen fraud with a reckless disregard for human life. I knew she was putting patients' lives in jeopardy. And she was saying things like, fake it till you make it. You do not do that with patients. The jury has spoken. Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes has officially been found guilty of four charges in a criminal fraud trial. Elizabeth Holmes had promised change the world now she is almost certainly going to prison american greed has the inside story of the tall tales spun for starry-eyed investors people want to make a killing out there the lies the spies the threats it's terrifying you're like is this person tailing me and the explosive defense raised at trial when holmes herself takes the stand Holmes says she's the victim of a decade of sexual and emotional abuse at the hands of her former boyfriend and business partner, Sonny Balwani. He, of course, denies all of this, calls the allegations deeply offensive and personally devastating. Now, some people say that this was a case of money versus humanity, but there's really a lot more going on here. By the time Elizabeth Holmes stands trial in the late summer of 2021, she is a walking Rorschach test. Young women dress up like her outside the courthouse and applaud the quote-unquote girl boss. The homies, the Elizabeth girls fandom is alive and thriving and they're all over social media. Their reasoning as well, male villains have become icons look at the wolf of wall street and jordan belford so why can't elizabeth holmes become a female icon others see the steve jobs wannabe accused of 11 counts of fraud against investors and patients as the symbol of everything wrong with silicon valley the hubris greed and duplicity but when she takes the stand in her own defense there's another persona victim ramesh sunny balwani holmes says balwani was a menacing president at Theranos, who called the shots and cast a shadow over her life. Will the jury buy her story? We have not seen an Elizabeth Holmes like this that breaks down, that cries, that is emotional. But at the end of the day, these abuse allegations really have nothing to do with what she's being charged with. I grew up in a family that was very focused on the belief that we're all here for and we're here to try to make this world a better place. Holmes grows up a child of privilege in Washington, D.C. Her mother is a congressional staffer, and her father is a former Enron executive. Though they're well off, the Holmes family seems obsessed with what they don't have, according to one-time neighbor and former family friend, Joseph Hughes. These kids are raised with the idea that even though we live in what most people would think of as a very nice upper middle class, way it's not good enough because it's not what the Fleischmann's have. Elizabeth Perrins, he says, like to remind people that the Holmes bloodline is descended from the famed Fleischmann yeast family. When we're not just supposed to be in a home most Americans would think is luxurious, we're supposed to be in an estate. We're better than this. At nine years old, little Elizabeth proclaims to her parents that she wants to be a billionaire. She certainly had encouragement from them to at least start in this direction. And there's no doubt it mind that for Elizabeth, the notion of becoming this family champion and restoring them to grandeur is part of who Elizabeth is. And she's got no time to waste. Right after high school graduation, the overachiever jets off to Beijing to study Mandarin as part of a Stanford University summer program. Amid all the other 18-year-old strivers, one person in the program sticks out. He's a 37-year-old man named Ramesh Sunny Balwani. 
Jeff is a software engineer, a seasoned veteran of Silicon Valley startups, and is already worth $40 million. Yet he and the soon-to-be freshman click. I was studying at a program in Beijing University in China, and he was there. Uh, she was very uh, famous in the Stanford Chinese program because the entire department knew about her Chinese, her skills, uh, and so that's how you know, when I first met her, I'm like, oh, you must be the Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes arrives at Stanford University in 2002 with an ambition so big, it's almost childlike. She wants to become the Thomas Edison of biomedical engineering. She's recommended to physician, inventor, and Stanford professor of medicine, Phyllis Gardner. She came to me. Gardner listens patiently to Holmes' idea, a wearable device that would simultaneously diagnose and treat disease. She wanted to make a skin patch, and she wanted to sample the blood to test for an infectious disease. And then she wanted to deliver antibiotics through the patch. Antibiotics are extremely, they're low potency. And a patch, you can't get things through the skin easily. And so how are you gonna do this? Gardner believes Holmes' idea would require a quantum leap in science. But according to her, Holmes doesn't want to hear it. I just couldn't help her. She wasn't, she didn't want help. I thought she knew the world of microfluidics and engineering, but she was just 19 and had a class or two. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the class. Undeterred, Holmes pursues a more receptive mentor, Stanford engineering professor Channing Robertson. Years later, New Yorker journalist Ken Auletta will interview both Holmes and Robertson. In describing Elizabeth Holmes, he said, how often in your life do you get to meet a Beethoven? someone who was a genius and he described her as a genius he left his tenure position to join her became a member of her board and was a devout believer in her i have to tell you that this is going to be a special year because this is the last time i'm teaching the class elizabeth holmes has charmed her first champion it seems holmes has all she needs from stanford at age 19 she drops out to start her fledgling company which in 2003 she dubs theranos a combination of therapy diagnosis. And after Channing Robertson, Holmes gets her first financial pat on the back in 2004. That's when Tim Draper, a well-known Silicon Valley venture capitalist, invests $500,000 in the fledgling company. And she said, I'm going to transform healthcare as we know it. Around this time, Holmes abandons the wearable idea and conjures a more audacious vision. One steep in a personal origin story she will recount years later when she's famous. Having a needle in your arm is something that has kept people from taking care of themselves, right? A absolutely, myself included. I'm absolutely terrified of it. Holmes' lifelong fear of needles, she says, makes her fixate on a device that could perform hundreds of blood tests from a finger prick. Holmes calls her prototype the Edison, with a nod to the great inventor. The idea of Theranos is a wonderful idea. We're going to make medicine cheaper for people. We're going to make it more convenient. It would be wonderfully disruptive, which is one of the things that Silicon Valley prides itself on. And the investor class is all in. By 2006, she's raised more than $40 million in venture capital, including is designed to give Theranos engineers a long runway to perfect the Edison and someday bring it to market. But there's one big problem, according to journalist John Carreyrou. The idea is more science fiction than science. When I started looking into Theranos, I learned early on by talking to laboratory scientists at universities. And the consensus among these, these scientists that I'd spoken to was that it wasn't possible. And it wasn't possible because that size of a sample isn't enough to do all those tests. And the quality of the sample that you get from a finger is just not as pure. It's polluted by tissue and cells that interfere. The pie in the sky idea becomes an albatross in the lab. And th blows through its initial investments. By 2009, it's broke, with little to show for it. Were you and Sunny Balwani ever engaged in a romantic relationship? Yes. Unbeknownst to investors, Sunny Balwani has been advising Elizabeth Holmes and secretly dating her. It will become an 11-year romance, with shocking details revealed at Holmes' trial. Holmes says when her relationship with Sunny first blossomed, she was vulnerable, because she had been sexually assaulted 
Stanford. She testifies that after confiding in Sonny, he told her, I was safe now that I met him. But it's not just emotional shelter Balwani offers, he's a financial haven too. Long story short, I ended up giving a 12 or 13 or 14 million dollar personal loan. I guaranteed a loan to the company. The loan comes at a critical time when Theranos is on life support. And just a few months after cutting this check, Balwani assumes the number two position at Theranos, Chief Operating Officer. He became the guy managing things day to day and he really became the heavy. Up next, Theranos goes live with patience. Walgreens, they have decided that your way is the way to go. But is Holmes recklessly dismissing warnings? and failure, but Elizabeth Holmes has a positive label for it, stealth mode. Just like her heroes, Holmes believes that success will be found right around the corner after one more experiment, one more iteration, one more try. I think her great strength was selling the vision, you know, getting investors excited in the vision. She has great charisma, great charm, and she's a great saleswoman. And thanks to her parents' connections, Holmes has another advantage that many Silicon Valley founder, Larry Ellison. She was able to get Larry Ellison to invest money. And I think once she had Ellison involved, I think it became a lot easier. Because from Ellison, she got George Schultz, and then she's off to the races. With a former Secretary of State on her team, the Evangelizer-in-Chief recruits a board stacked with a who's who of Pentagon and Capitol Hill beginners. George Schultz really was the architect of the board. He then reached out to Henry Kissinger and James Mattis, the Marine General, and Bill Frist, the former Senate Majority Leader, Republican Majority Leader, and Sam Nunn, the former Democratic Senator from Georgia. Virtually none of them had any experience in medicine or science, so they were not equipped to stress test her claims. They believed what they were told. The board raised questions when Holmes hints that Theranos is about to sign a huge deal with the Pentagon. The ability to take a technology like this and put it in flight, specifically on a medevac, has the potential to change survival rate. But no such deal is in the works. Theranos even refuses to share its financial statement with investors, using the famous names on the board to deflect questions. And now you have a person who can tell investors they can't see audited financial and they can't see things because she has Larry Ellison involved. Then who are you to think you're brighter than he is? For three years, Theranos has been in talks with Walgreens, the drugstore giant with annual sales of around $140 billion. Holmes imagines a future of consumer-driven medicine where patients can walk into a Walgreens and order their own blood tests. For us, the individual has be at the center of getting information about their own health because it's the only way in which people can then begin to take control of their health. The landmark $140 million partnership is made public in September 2013 and Theranos kisses stealth mode goodbye. Walgreens, they have decided that your way is the way to go. It's the first time most people have heard of Theranos and the company needs to move fast to get its device ready to go live and test Real patients in Walgreens stores. New scientists must be brought on board. At that point, I was super impressed. I was like, wow, I'm an entry-level you know, worker coming into this startup. Erica Chung is 23 at the time, fresh out of UC Berkeley with a degree in molecular biology. Just one month after the big deal is announced, Chung finds herself in a Theranos conference room with Sonny Balwani. He said, okay, you're going to interview with Elizabeth. And at that point, I think, it's like embarrassing to admit now, but also it makes sense considering the time I was starstruck. See if Theranos' proprietary device, a hush-hush vibe, pervades the lab. They kind of created that ambiance. Like we were part of a sort of governmental agency or the CIA or something sort of top secret or that there was a lot to protect here. But the more Chung learns about Theranos, the more she wonders why they're being so protective. I, I was primarily working with the Edison. And 
My job was to run a bunch of tests to make sure the device was working. There were so many issues with this device that almost every day it was telling me this machine is not producing accurate results. Chung naturally shares these unsettling results with colleagues via email. And then all of a sudden, Sonny would respond to them out of nowhere. He wasn't CC'd, he wasn't BCC'd, but all of a sudden they were responding to the emails that we were writing. Things that we had said in certain contexts would be reiterated to us, like things that we would say in private with one another. They are monitoring our emails, like we can't even trust whether they're recording conversations that we are having. We are being treated as we could potentially be traitors. Up next, the stakes are raised when Chung works with real life patients. It's a nightmare. Every day, you're just like, this is wrong. I feel sick. Like, I can't do this. In September of 2015, Elizabeth Holmes drops by CNBC Studios to talk about Theranos' origin story. But where did the original idea come from? Meaning, what was it that inspired you to even do this? It, it came from losing uh, my family members and people that, that I loved. Early detection of disease. Holmes claims it will save lives. And in Arizona, Theranos lobbyists work to change the law so patients can enter a Walgreens and order any test they want without a doctor's order. To build a healthcare system in which early detection and prevention become a reality, that is why we work to pass this law. It's why we believe Arizona's law can and should serve as a model for the nation for direct access testing. There was this certain patina of credibility that this company had because they're in a Walgreens. You had elected officials here in Arizona doing press conferences. Elizabeth, I, I want you to know I appreciate the partnership and investment Theranos has made in Arizona. And I look forward to working with you in the years to come. So I think in a lot of times people's immediate reaction was, well, this has got to be legitimate. Merle Ellsworth, a retired dentist in Phoenix, walks into his local Walgreens for a looks like cancer. To have a number that high would indicate that uh, something was multiplying rather rapidly within me. His doctor wants to verify the result, and Ellsworth ends up taking three Theranos tests. Results are all over the map. Some indicate cancer, some are normal. The fourth test uses the time-tested venous blood draw. This one is accurate, indicating he does not have cancer. What people were being sold was not at all what they were getting. Erica Chung says when patients give that small finger prick sample of blood, they think the test is going to be performed right there at the drugstore on the Edison device. That wasn't actually what was going on in reality. They were just sort of collecting the vial blood at a Walgreens, sending it over to a main laboratory that we had in Palo Alto, and then having people like me basically run it on a whole wide variety of devices. Because its own device is so unreliable, prosecutors say Theranos secretly takes patient samples and tests them on machines made by other companies. But for those samples to work, these third-party machines must be modified and the samples diluted which can give inaccurate results. But there were many instances that we knew we made a mistake and they would not let us tell patients, you need to come in for a redraw because they didn't want people to realize the errors that were going on internally. Lab errors can have tragic consequences. At Holmes's trial, a woman with a history of miscarriages testifies that a Theranos blood test told her she was about to miscarry again. She says she considered preemptively terminating the pregnancy to spare herself any more pain, but she sought a second opinion. She shudders to think what would have happened if she hadn't taken another test. Her daughter is now six years old and healthy. For Erica Chung, her first job out of college is forcing her to deal with issues most people will never have to confront. Things like healthy people being told they have cancer or HIV. It's incredibly stressful. And the fact that you see yourself working for this company that is lying to patients, it's a nightmare. Every day, you're just challenging yourself of like, this is wrong, I feel sick, like I can't do this. Erica repeatedly warns her superiors, including Sunny Balwani, that the device isn't working. 
but Holmes is busy with photo shoots. The summer of 2014 is her coming out party. It's the myth of the founder, the female edition. It was all about achieving that perfect calibration between masculinity and femininity. In order to realize a world in which prevention is a reality. You had a deep voice, deep blonde bob, and piercing huge blue eyes that just penetrated you whenever you spoke with her. To evaluate multi-site precision, or in our case, multi-device precision. She just spoke with such assurance, such a belief. Let me tell you what is really happening here. For years, people have wondered if her voice is genuine. People are fascinated by the deep voice. Like, why does she have a deep voice? Some point to an NPR interview from 2005 where the voice, and maybe the facade, seems to crack. Uh, just for a second. No, it hasn't. Well, if I use traditional words to describe what we're doing, it's hard because people then associate it with conventional processes. And at trial, Holmes hints that Sonny might be a modern-day Pygmalion responsible for her transformation. She says Sonny told her to kill her old self and become a new Elizabeth and to act like a man. In one text exchange shown to the jury, Sonny writes, you are speaking with everyone in your giddy voice. Excessive use of awesome. And later, appearing to drive the point home, he writes, I have molded you. Up next, if Elizabeth Holmes is just a character, how long can she keep up the act? A lot of it was like this constant strive for perfection. And that's dangerous. In her public image, Holmes is seemingly monastic, wearing nothing but black turtlenecks, consuming little more than green juices, and not dating. In reality, the home she and Sonny Balwani share in Atherton is the type of house that gets its own highly produced narrated short film when it hits the market. This home is a classic example of French provincial architecture. They fly and a team of security guards shuttle her and Sonny codenamed Eagle One and Eagle Two into black SUVs. I've always believed that, you know, everywhere there's a glass ceiling, there's an Iron Lady right underneath it. The press is fawning, and Elizabeth apparently believes her own PR. She texts Balwani, total confidence in myself, best business person of the year. In 2014, Rupert Murdoch invests another $100 million. The Walton family of Walmart fame invests $150 million, and the DeVos family puts $100 million into Theranos. Forbes magazine estimates her personal net worth at $4.5 billion, and Theranos' valuation climbs to $9 billion. What you've managed to do has caught a lot of people to company. Ken Auletta is a big-name journalist with The New Yorker and is given the VIP tour of Theranos. And it was an amazingly elaborate... If you just looked at that, it was really impressive. There's an article this week, you gotta read, it's in The New Yorker, and it is by Ken Auletta. His article, published in late 2014, is largely positive. So it's a real threat to the existing infrastructure of needle testing. He says now that Holmes lied to him, but Auletta does sound some notes of caution. I, I think there are questions about it, and I think the company is overly secretive. I mean, I took the test twice in a drugstore in Palo Alto. I insisted on seeing the machine it went into, so I said, what happens to the nanotainer? How do you ascertain what my blood tests reveal? And she gave me this convoluted answer. And six times I went back to her, and six times it was gobbledygook. And that's when I described in the profile I wrote, her answers to the questions are sometimes comically opaque. As Holmes explains to Auletta, a chemistry is performed so that a chemical reaction occurs and generates a signal from the chemical interaction with the sample, which is translated into a result. The fact that any time you would ask her very pointed questions about the science and technology, that she would sort of back off and, and not want to discuss it or to find some sort of workaround, I mean, that's a big indicator sometimes of like, well, maybe the person doesn't know. At a Fortune magazine forum, Holmes struggles to answer an easy question. How can you do, you know, run all of these tests with such a small amount of blood? And why hasn't anybody done this before? Over the last 11 years, we've reinvented the 
traditional laboratory infrastructure, we, we went through redeveloping every test um, that is run in a traditional laboratory to be able to operate on these tiny volumes of blood or, or other fluids. One point seems clear. You can create a new reality when you do it that way. And so, um, so that's how, how we've approached it. Well, you've definitely created a new reality. A new reality with zero tolerance for bad news, according to Erica Chung. Every time I would go closer and closer to the top level leadership, the more and more pushback I got in terms of like, well, this isn't a problem with the Edison devices. This is a problem with you. And maybe you need to reconsider what you're doing. Text messages between Sonny and Elizabeth show they believe the fault lies with their employees, not their technology. Talking about her staff, Elizabeth writes, this is where our problems are. In another thread, Sonny echoes, most disappointing how bad these people are. Sonny had essentially said, you need to decide if you want to work here and basically test patient samples without question. And in my mind, I knew 100% that I could not. And so I left the company and I quit. And I think I was, sir, you know, what happened? What explains the refusal of Holmes, Balwani, and board members to acknowledge clear problems? Ken Auletta has a few possible explanations. The first word that comes to mind when I think of Elizabeth Holmes is Zella. I started to see business as a vehicle for making a change in the world. These are people who really believed they were doing God's work. And by God's work, I mean they believed they were advancing a social good. No person should have to walk away from getting a medical service because they can't afford it. And so we're going to do whatever it takes. I think the other factor that helps explain the board's tendency to applaud her was greed. People got to make a killing out there. And I think that was very alluring to them. I must say, you're an extraordinary woman. Thank you for being here. Up next, employees discover it's not easy to put their Theranos experiences in the rear view mirror. It's terrifying. You're driving in your car. You're like, is this person tailing me? Want more greed? Follow us on Instagram, connect on Facebook, and listen to the American Greed Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be right back. The halo effect surrounding Elizabeth Holmes doesn't charm everyone, and some of those skeptics are about to have their day. In addition to being a former neighbor and family friend of Elizabeth Holmes, Joseph Fuse is also an attorney and biotech entrepreneur in his own right. He and his father, Richard Fuse, hold many patents on medical devices. My father's the creative one, there's no doubt. He is brimming with, uh, always brimming with new ideas. In 2011, Elizabeth Holmes accuses Fuse Pharma of stealing one of Theranos' ideas. The Fuses vehemently deny the charge and defend themselves against Theranos' outside counsel, David Boyce. Considered one of the most aggressive litigators in America, Boyce is also a Theranos board member and is partially compensated in Theranos stock. I think of myself as a decent lawyer, but, but not against David Boyce. So I, I, I handicapped our chances as, as not so good. Over three and a half years of costly, brutal litigation, Fuse allies himself with people who seem to know a lot about Elizabeth Holmes. People like Phyllis Gardner. I was in the room with my father, my father called Phyllis, and literally within the first minute, I could hear Phyllis's voice saying fraud through the phone. The way I describe it is like a burr under my saddle. You founded this company 12 years ago. She was everywhere. She'd pop up on CNN and everywhere, and you're like, oh, that's just crazy. And, and Phyllis had a lot to say. And, and that, that made us uh, feel a little centered again, because we had felt at that point quite out of balance in this alternative universe. I knew she was putting patients' lives in jeopardy. And she was saying things like, fake it till you make it. You don't do that. You do not do that with patients. This little cabal that also formed as a result of that case became a, a, a seed in her demise. Fuse reaches out to John Kerry Rue at the Wall Street Journal. Kerry Rue digs further, finding numerous insiders, including the former lab director, Dr. Adam Rosendorf. It turned out, after talking to him, I learned very quickly that the, the company was lying. They went and 
modified third-party machines made by companies like Siemens and tried to adapt them to small finger stick samples. And that created a host of problems. When you're diluting samples too much, you're creating problems with accuracy. Carrie Rue also interviews Erica Chung. Honestly, it was like a breath of fresh air. I was like, oh, okay, all right, I'm not crazy. And so it was a relief. Like, finally, the truth is going to get out there. The relief doesn't last long. Elizabeth and Sonny soon catch wind that former employees are talking to the Wall Street Journal, and they launch a ferocious counterattack. Elizabeth texts Sonny, this whole thing that we have to respond to liars is ridiculous, and he assumes them to be true. Sonny responds, which is why knocking the legs off one at a time is best way. In trying to find the source of the leak, Sonny texts, I am narrowing this down to five people. We'll nail this mother... Their crusade to silence Carrie Rue's sources leads to action ripped from the script of a thriller. Since quitting Theranos, Chung is lying low, temporarily staying with friends while she starts another job. She believes a private investigator is trailing her all over town, and her suspicion is confirmed as she walks to her car one night. The guy jumps out of his tinted window SUV and is like Erica, and he's like gunning towards me, and he hands me this letter. It's addressed to Erica at the apartment of the friend with whom she's been living. And so I'm freaked out, because at this point, they're not only sitting outside of my new employment, they're also following me, because there's no one who knows this address, right? I'm just staying here temporarily. The letter accuses Erica of defamation and sharing trade secrets. The list of demands has seven points and threatens a lawsuit. Erica, who has little money and resources at the time, says her stomach sinks when she sees the signature line. Like, oh, great. What have I gotten myself into now? On the stand, Holmes will be confronted by Jack Stones for the E. Chung Project. It's terrifying. You're driving in your car, and if you have someone that follows you for more than six blocks, you're like, is this person tailing me? And just this morning, the Wall Street Journal made a pretty scathing article about the company. On October 15, 2015, 10 months after Kerry Rue begins digging, the Wall Street Journal breaks the first in a series of Kerry Rue's excoriating exposés. Miss Holmes, welcome back to Mad Money. Within hours, Holmes launches a righteous counter-defensive. I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this. Holmes and her supporters accuse Kerry Rue of being a sexist bully, and she plays the victim. This is what happens when you work to change things, and first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Off camera is a different story. She threatened me and the Wall Street Journal with litigation. Her boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, threatened doctors who had spoken to me on the record and tried to get them to recant. Those are the actions of a bully. Carrie Rue believes Holmes and Balwani got caught up in the culture of Silicon Valley where buggy beta versions of software can be released to the public and later perfected. And so I think she and Sonny didn't see it as a problem that in the fall of 2013, they went live with blood tests that weren't perfected. They figured they would iterate over time. But while you can do that in the software industry where lives aren't at stake, uh, you can't really get away with doing that in the healthcare industry. In the fall of 2015, Federal lab regulators sanctioned Theranos for putting patients in immediate jeopardy. Holmes is later banned from owning or running a lab for two years. All you can do is, is learn from your mistakes. In an interview with NBC's Maria Shriver, Holmes vows never give up. What I want to do is realize this mission, and at any point in time, I will do whatever it takes to serve this company in the best way I can. Do you think this company will survive? Absolutely. No doubt? No doubt. Two years later, Theranos shuts down for good. And in the same year, more bad news for Holmes. Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes has been indicted on federal wire fraud charges. The feds charge her and Balwani with multiple counts of fraud and conspiracy to commit fraud against investors and patients. Up next on American Greed. After they read the verdict and they took the jury out, Elizabeth Holmes got up. She went over, embraced her parents. Her father kissed her on her forehead, and she walked out. The 
the big question hovering over the trial of Elizabeth Holmes, will she take the stand in her own defense, is answered on November 19th. You know, it was a surprise to pretty much everyone in the courtroom, certainly uh, probably a surprise to the government. Just the shock value alone. I was in the courtroom, I can tell you, the jurors were riveted as she sat there very confidently, often smiling, talking about the early days of Theranos. Under questioning from her attorneys, a theme takes shape. It's known as the Svengali defense. You know, he was the older man who was controlling Elizabeth. He was manipulating her. He was dominating her. And she was in his thrall. The jury sees a handwritten note from Balwani to Holmes titled, Non-Negotiables. It begins, every morning I will force myself out of bed and spend 30 minutes, never a minute less, to write what I want from my day. Elizabeth writes a daily schedule, under Sonny's supervision, she says, that has her rising at 4 a.m. to thank God. Dinner is broccoli and quinoa. I am never a minute late, she writes to herself. I show no excitement. My hands are always in my pockets or gesturing. But the prosecution shows jurors emails they claim show that Holmes is very much in control. When the finger stick machines are malfunctioning, yet Holmes is often a media tour, Balwani texts her, I am worried about overexposure without solid substance, which is lacking right now. Holmes later shoots back, that media is why we're getting AmeriCare, an insurance company. But ultimately, she had the final say. If there was something that Sonny wanted to do that she disagreed with, it didn't happen. She was in charge. The jurors also see this NBC interview. I'm the founder and CEO of this company. Anything that happens in this company is my responsibility at the end of the day. On January 3rd, 2022, after a four-month trial, the jury returns with its verdict. Elizabeth Holmes found it guilty. Holmes defiant till the end, taking the stand in her own defense, blaming others, including her former business partner and boyfriend. But unlike with some investors, she was not able to convince a jury that she was blameless. A federal jury found the Theranos founder guilty on four counts of fraud for misleading investors on what her blood testing company's machines could do. The jury acquitted Holmes on all charges related to defrauding patients. And the jury was deadlocked on three charges involving early investors. Elizabeth, do you have any reaction to your guilty verdicts here? Elizabeth, any reaction? Do you have anything you want to say? The woman once hailed as the next Steve Jobs, now facing up to 20 years per guilty count behind bars. It's a big deal for Silicon Valley because if fake it till you make it, I don't think they're going to be living by that anymore. One lingering question. Did Holmes believe her lies? Ken Arlett. I'm more prone to believe that she was a zealot and she was blinded by her zealotry. But... If I'm intellectually honest, I have to deal with the fact that she lied about a number of things, just blatantly lied. When she told me that 99% of the blood tests she did were finger prick, that's a conscious lie. When she told me that she had a military contract and revenue for the military, that's just a lie. And that's not zealotry. Phyllis Gardner says that despite Holmes's public rhetoric about promoting women in science, the disgraced and doesn't live up to those lofty ideals. Why'd you do what you did to Erica Chung, if you're such a champion of women? Why did you treat the women at your work the way you did? Why did you treat women patients the way you did? You're not a champion of women. She's not a champion of women. She's a liar. <laughs>